Hello and welcome to our second talk hosted by STEM for You. Uh, STEM for You is a group of uh, faculty and um, staff on campus. And uh, we formed to help support um, uh, all minorities in, that are interested in STEM, uh, traditionally as being female um, scientists, but uh, our goal is to support uh, minorities of um, and any minority that is interested in STEM. So uh, this is our second talk and uh, thank uh, Nicole, um, I'm gonna butcher your last name, <laughs> Janiti, for, um, uh, uh, for agreeing to talk, uh, to talk about all the amazing um, opportunities that there exist at the DNA lab, the Tick Research Lab. And uh, it's also a huge asset to the community, everything that this lab does. So thank you so much, Nicole, for doing this. Absolutely. All right, good evening, everyone. Um, we have a couple folks in house and then some folks um, in avatar world online. Um, so we're gonna get started. Um, I'll introduce myself. Um, I am uh, Dr. Nicole Chinesi. And I'm the director at the East Stroudsburg University, uh, Dr. Jane Hoffman Wildlife Genetics Institute. And we're gonna talk a lot today about what we do and the opportunities that are available for students um, at our facility. So keyboard didn't work, does that work? Maybe, next slide. <laughs> There we go. Um, so when you think about DNA and non-human work, when it involves um, animals, food, plant, microorganisms, just to kind of give you an idea of what you could utilize DNA for um, in terms of research and some of the things that we do uh, at the lab. So I'm gonna pull up if I can do, maybe not. Anyway, um, over here, I have uh, this map that has all these different opportunities that you can use to research uh, utilizing DNA. Um, up here is animals um, involving things such as animal attacks, so animals attacking another animal. Um, there could be uh, crimes related to uh, stealing of livestock, illegally poaching livestock. Um, at the bottom, we have things such as microorganisms and outbreaks, such as things such as COVID um, as an opportunity. Um, in our relationship, we're utilizing um, identification of pathogens within ticks and microorganisms that way to look at surveillance and understanding how diseases are spreading in the environment from both the vector of the tick side as well as the reservoir host side and in the small mammals. Um, so you can really utilize DNA in a lot of different avenues and we only explore some of those avenues in the lab, which opens up opportunities for students to really um, learn about some of these other opportunities um, and engage in utilizing our current technology and our equipment to answer some questions maybe that they might be interested in. Um, so what is the Dr. Jane Hoffman Wildlife Genetics Institute? So it was founded by distinguished professor, Dr. Jane Hoffman. Um, it started, she started doing research pertaining to a lot of different organisms um, in the late 80s when she first became a professor at East Strasburg University. Um, she did become a distinguished professor at her time here. Um, and what she did was she developed a state-of-the-art institution uh, that really took student learning and engagement to a new level. Uh, students were involved in various different undergraduate and master's thesis research opportunities, um, exploring many different avenues to wildlife, diseases, parasites, uh, things such as that. Um, we're located on the first floor of the Innovation Center, which is not directly on campus. It is just down the road from uh, campus, but we're on the first floor. We have six full uh, state-of-the-art labs, um, and we also have a bunch of office and conference room spaces that we have. We have a full-time staff and many different opportunities for students to engage in our what we're currently doing, as well as potentially developing into research opportunities if you're interested um, in that. So some of our focuses. So DNA um, is sort of the center of everything that we do. Um, DNA or RNA, we utilize that to answer some questions um, that we might have in terms of what's going on in the environment. 
Um, and we've used that in tick-borne disease testing. Uh, so we have some funding from the state, the Department of Health, where individuals from around uh, Pennsylvania and across the world will send their ticks into our facility at East Strasburg University, and we test them for various different tick-borne pathogens. Um, and then we also use that for surveillance in the environment. We'll go out, we'll drag, we'll collect ticks um, and evaluate density and pathogen prevalence within certain environments. Um, and then we take that data and we build statistical models to try to be able to predict um, how we could determine if a year is going to be a year with uh, an increased amount of ticks. It could be a lower year of ticks, whether we're going to see an emergence of a pathogen or how pathogens are interacting in uh, tick hosts. Um, so we do really build a lot of information off of that surveillance and that data that we're generating through the lab. Um, and then also we utilize it in studies such as population genetics. So looking at how populations interact with each other, um, how large populations are, how populations are doing with the current management plans that are going on in states. So uh, looking at the conservation of wildlife. Um, so each state will have a plan and a, um, in place for a specific species and we could assist with utilizing genetic applications to evaluate um, how that population's doing. We look at mark recapture, we, we use Lincoln Peterson models to evaluate um, uh, population estimates based off of samples from non-invasive sampling to samples collected from the harvest and how often the population and animals are resampled. We also do wildlife forensics. So we have two certified wildlife forensic scientists on staff, myself and one other. Um, we also participate in national boards with developing standards for wildlife forensics. Wildlife forensics is becoming um, a new sort of field of study. Um, it's not new in terms of it's been in existence for a while, but it's now becoming into the forefront with human forensics. And we sit alongside human forensics board members um, to make it more standardized so that the facilities that are conducting wildlife forensics are all following the same standards and guidelines um, and evaluating samples in the same fashion. And then wildlife diseases. Um, so looking at surveillance of various different diseases um, that are in the environment, um, it could be tick related, uh, it could be other pathogens that might be surrounding um, and threatening our populations. Um, one example is we have a grad student currently, she is working on snake fungal disease detection um, and rattlesnakes, and that's a collaborative effort between the DNA lab and faculty of East Stroudsburg and the biology department. So there's various opportunities there for engagement and utilizing the technology to explore um, other avenues associated with diseases um, and things DNA can answer questions for. So really to dive into um, what the student engagement is and what your the opportunities are at the lab. So just to kind of talk a little bit about the first part, which is the majority of our research is focused around uh, tick surveillance, whether it's passive or active. So passive is more of a surveillance tool used. Um, some people call it passive. Some folks can refer to it as like a citizen science type approach um, where you have individuals submitting samples to your facility um, and then you utilize the data that you produce from those samples um, to study and surveillance what's happening in the environment. Um, so we do both, and then active is going actively out into the field, into uh, areas of study um, and collecting uh, specimens that way. Um, but why ticks? Um, we study ticks for many different reasons, um, but the main reason is the public health crisis associated with the pathogens that they can transmit to the human population. Um, and a lot of the information that we don't currently know about the tick population. They have the potential to vector various different tick-borne illnesses. Um, we have a student right now, she's evaluating um, all of our tick samples from 2022 to see if any of the ticks are carriers of COVID. Um, so there's a potential for these ticks to be vectors for more than just Lyme disease that we hear of or things such as Powassan virus or anaplasmosis. Um, and we discover new tick-borne pathogens um, constantly. And we also discover new strains. And we also discover that these uh, vectors carry pathogens that once may not have been associated with a pathogen in the human population, um, but are becoming more frequently diagnosed. Um, one of which is Babesia otocoilii, which is protozoal infection um, associated with cervids, white-tailed deer, elk, moose, things such as that. But more recently, there have been a lot of cases um, of pretty 
serious babesiosis across Pennsylvania, where the parasite is sequestering into the membrane of, um, of your brain and causing some really long-term detrimental issues. Um, and Babesia microti was originally thought to be the pathogen associated with these uh, severe illnesses, um, but it's becoming more the forefront that it's potentially this Babesia otocoilii instead, um, which wasn't known to be a human pathogen until just recently. Um, and we find it in a significant number of our ticks in Pennsylvania. So things such as that um, allow us to sort of be on the forefront of what's happening and emerging in this uh, vector foreign disease world. Um, but there's a lot of myths out there as well. So the public health side of what we do and why we're evaluating ticks is really important. So when it comes to ticks, a lot of individuals just think of Lyme disease. I may have now uttered off a handful of different pathogens that are associated with ticks. Um, being able to identify, so here's on the screen is three different types of ticks, but these are only the adult phase. Um, there are males, there are nymphs, there are larvae, there are a bunch of different types of uh, life stages. There are appearances, sizes, shapes, they change throughout. Um, so being able to educate the public um, on the awareness of what are you looking for, um, what's associated with uh, the ticks, what pathogens may be associated with each different tick species, um, how do they survive in the environment, when are they active, um, does temperature change um, play a role in their activity? Does um, the dew point, this relative humidity, all these things play a role in tick activity? Um, I bet everyone here probably thinks ticks are only associated with summer or spring, right? Do you probably think that? Yes. Um, well, yesterday we received, received 200 ticks in the mail because of our recent spikes in temperatures and weather over 50 degrees in across many counties of Pennsylvania, um, the ticks will become active. Um, we become active and the ticks are becoming active. Um, we like to go outside when it's nice and the ticks like to come out and seek a host when it's nice. Um, so both of those create a perfect storm for exposure um, because most individuals, their knowledge and awareness is spring or summer, um, they're not practicing tick prevention. Pets, they're not maybe providing prevention for their pets during these times of the year. And it increases our, their exposures um, and we receive um, more tick submissions, which is great. But that also tells us that we need to uh, provide more education, that it is a year round exposure potential, especially when there's not snowfall. So with passive surveillance, what are we doing? Like, what is the process of it? So our funding from the State Department of Health uh, comes to us. And what we do is we provide free tick testing to residents. And now it's a twofold approach. So this is the first ever statewide passive surveillance study. It's the longest ever statewide um, passive surveillance study to be conducted in the United States. Um, and what we're doing is we're, we're collecting important information. What tick-borne diseases are in Pennsylvania, identifying hot spots of where those diseases are occurring, where it's the distribution of our tick species and that activity of our ticks that are occurring throughout the years and months, um, demographics of the tick bites. So who's being exposed? Um, is it our children under the ages of nine? Um, is it adults over the ages of 55? Is it our college-based student population? Who's being exposed? Um, where are the tick exposures occurring? Where are the tick bites occurring on the body? Are there associated factors with potentially um, where the tick may attach to help us push out more education? So we're collecting a lot of information. And then the second fold of that is we're also able to provide early detection of exposure to a pathogen. Um, so the program's not around to diagnose anybody. We don't diagnose anybody with any tick-borne illness. We're not medical doctors in any aspect. But what we're doing is we're identifying if the tick is a carrier of a tick-borne pathogen, which identifies whether or not you've been exposed. Um, I, we also identify risk. Risk is identified based off of the engorgement of the tick. So as a tick feeds on a person or an animal, it will increase in size. And we measure the size of the tick in relation to um, its shield. And it gives us a ratio to determine a relative amount of time a tick could be attached and feeding. So the longer the tick is attached, the greater your risk of that pathogen that it might be carrying to have transmitted. Um, so we give you if it's a carrier and how um, risky of transmission could have occurred. Um, we do notify the individuals via text message, email, and then also their physician so that they can have that information to guide 
um, they're uh, determining the next steps, whether treatment is going to occur, signs and symptoms, really to be able to decipher um, what's really gonna happen um, and where to go from there. Um, so there's these are five important reasons. Um, so it depends, it determines if you've been exposed, it determines the risk of your transmission, it guides your phys physician with your diagnosis and treatment, both physician and veterinarian as well. You get your results really quick. Usually your results come back within 72 hours of us receiving your tick, which sometimes can be even faster than uh, symptoms may even occur. Um, and DNA testing can be 99.9% .9 accurate because we're targeting specific regions of the pathogens. Um, but to, and because it's utilizing qPCR, um, the accuracy of it is even higher without cross-reacting between similar species. It's very easy. People go online, ticklab.org. Um, they fill out an order form, they mail the ticket in the lab, they drop it off, and then they don't need a kit, we send them the results. Um, what's included in that testing are a lot of different bacteria, protozoal, and viral testing. Um, this is just to list a few. But really, what do the students get out of this? Um, so the students are involved directly with our testing. They work alongside with our research technicians that are very talented researchers, and they assist our researchers with our day-to-day -day activities. So it could be anything from prepping tubes, prepping samples, helping when the mail comes in with identifying tick species, learning how to use that cotomous keys. Um, if you're interested in more of an ecological approach, dichotomous keys and things such as that would be very useful. Um, you are exposed to understanding what a standard of practice is, an SOP. So understanding how to follow a pretty strict protocol and then how to troubleshoot a protocol if something goes wrong. Um, these are very important skill sets to have, especially if you want to go into laboratory, testing, research, pharmaceutical companies, even if you were gonna go to med school, um, being able to utilize and follow standards and guidelines and practices are really important skill sets to kind of have. Um, it helps with becoming confident in your ability to work in a sterile environment. So sterile environments are important across the board. If you're working in a lab, if you want to go on to be a veterinarian, if you want to go on to be some, a physician, a nurse, um, being able to work in a sterile environment and understand how to touch and move um, is a really important um, skill set to have. Um, because if you just move and touch your face, um, you've now just contaminated things. So it becomes um, secondhand nature uh, working in, a, in an environment such as this day to day as a student. Um, it gives you hands on experiences to strengthen various different lab skills from pipetting, micro pipetting, to handling different samples, to labeling, to following that standards of practice that we talked about, to recording data, analyzing data, many different skills that you'll use throughout the lab process. Um, the students directly assist with DNA and RNA extractions. Um, these pictures here are actually to the uh, two students right here, um, working and shadowing each other on a DNA extraction. So you also get the interaction to assist students with learning. Um, so you might be the student per, per, uh, actually working on samples, and then you might have a newer student that just started in the lab that's shadowing you. Um, so you become sort of the lead student and you can help interact with that student and teach them what techniques you've learned, what may have worked for you, and really help in that student learning process as well. Um, we have various different state-of-the-art clinical equipment in the lab. Um, this is a, what's called over here to the right is a MagnaPure 96 magnetic bead extraction platform. It's a very fancy name for a robotic instrument that extracts DNA using magnetic bead technology. So there's glass beads that are put into your sample. Um, it binds DNA in the presence of salt. It purifies it and then it elutes in a tube using this double robotic arm technology. Um, it's used in all clinical laboratories across the United States. It's been used for COVID testing. Um, it's a really unique platform that we have access to um, use here at East Strasburg University. Um, we hone in on all of our contamination prevention and that working in a sterile environment. Um, and then we do both independent and group projects. So as you grow through the lab, um, you might be interested in research, but you might just be interested in just working on small projects and just learning different things throughout the lab. Um, and those opportunities are available as you grow within your experiences. We have students that work 
um, as they grow directly with our QPCR team. So we have different departments within the lab. Um, our QPCR team works on their workstations in sterile environments and clean rooms um, on prepping all different types of um, testing, whether it's for ticks, whether it's for forensics. Um, there's many different QPCR assays and, and testing that we do. Um, and it gains your understanding of what DNA and RNA technology is and how it could be used in the detection of different pathogens, wildlife diseases, tick-borne illnesses, uh, things such as that. Um, students also engage with our researchers on how to analyze data. Um, so the outputs of our qPCR instruments, what do they need? Um, how do and why do we create different standards and guidelines and cutoffs for what's determined to be a positive and what's determined to be a negative? Um, how do we create those standard curves, those standards to be able to evaluate what a true positive is versus what can be cross-reaction versus noise, things such as that. So you learn to work in with the researchers in quality control or QC, uh, why we use different controls throughout the process from start to finish, learning what that means um, throughout, shadowing and insisting on R&D and validation of current and new technologies. So we are constantly um, revamping our current technologies. So looking at what new um, reagents uh, per se are out there. So in QPCR, you have reagents, you have um, primers and probes that help detect the pathogen. You have the technology and the platform and the equipment and how that advances through time. We're always looking to stay up with modern technology and advancing that and students are able to assist with that development and that research to make sure that we are on the, um, the front of the, the technology boom, as you might say. So outside of the laboratory, there are some other opportunities at the lab, um, but moving still in the direction of our tick research, we have some funding also from the state, a separate line of funding, where we're conducting a five-year tick mitigation study. Um, this tick mitigation study is mainly focused on field collections, but also involves some lab um, work as well to analyze the samples once um, the field season's uh, over. We've launched in two counties, both Monroe and Pike County. Across these two counties, we have 18 total sites. Within these sites, we've created these 750 meter square plots. They're 75 meters in length and 10 meters into the wood line. Um, they're across uh, many different types of uh, areas within both Monroe and Pike County. So we have residential properties, we have state and public parks, um, we have schools, um, various different uh, areas and habitats. Um, our researchers have gone in, they've evaluated all these sites and they've been collecting baseline data to really get a feel for what all of the variables are at these sites from the elevation to the slope of the sites and the plots to canopy cover, vegetation, ground cover, um, leaf litter density, anything that we can measure that could potentially built, be built into a model where if you go to say maybe Delaware, and you plug in what your uh, canopy cover is, what your ground density is, what your leaf litter is, whether it's carnivorous, whether it's deciduous, um, you can ultimately get an output that will tell you the likelihood of the density of ticks and small mammals in that given area. Um, so that's another goal of this project. Once we're done with our baseline data collection sometime late summer, we're gonna start to deploy some mitigation strategies. Um, there's various different mitigation that we're going to use, but our main one is to evaluate the effectiveness of an anti-tick vaccine on reduction of feeding ticks on small mammals, as well as tick-borne pathogens within the tick population uh, through the five-year study. The study is five years because we want to see a generation of mice and small mammals, as well as tick populations. We want to see a whole generation through um, into a second generation to see how this um, vaccine is really playing a role in reducing Arctic populations. We have both control sites. We have positive controls where we'll be deploying um, some um, pest control in sprays, so some uh, acaricides in that aspect. Um, control sites that will receive no vaccine, but just untreated baits. 
These are our bait stations that we put out. They are on timers. Um, each station gets 100 pellets. It rotates every two weeks. Um, so it works as a vaccination booster. Um, and our goal with this too is to hone in on what is the dosage that's required for a wild mouse population. Um, our current studies with the company that has created this vaccine are just lab related. So we only know what it, the um, population of a lab related animal is when it's given dosages and it's very controlled. So what is the dosage in a wildlife population? How often do they revisit? these stations and feed, how much bait are they consuming? Um, we'll be trapping and retrapping animals and recollecting blood samples to look at their vaccine levels through time and how pathogen loads and densities um, of ticks feeding on them um, will change through time as well. So it's a very detailed project. It just started, um, but students have been working. We have five total students have been working on this project since it started over the summer. Um, they're working with our research field technicians. They're assisting with the day-to-day -day sampling. They're both in the field and in the lab. They're understanding how to read and follow standards of practice. So we have protocols and methods of how our plots are created, how to uh, collect your leaf density, how to collect your um, canopy coverage, um, how to do your vegetation survey and what's considered your plots within a plot um, to calculate that. Um, they're getting hands-on experience with all the different surveys that we're collecting data on, um, as well as their research skills and how to collect data, um, how to interact with other students and other teammates and other researchers on collecting data, um, being able to have those conversations um, and become confident on their skills to collect, record, um, and sample animals. They assist with directly with the small mammal trapping, so all the students go through their IOCOOK training, um, they pass in all the protocols, they get an understanding of animal safety. Um, they directly work with the researchers on how to appropriately hold a small mammal um, and even how to sample it. They might, they might just you know, learn how to do morphological measures and how to measure um, the animal. They might actually even proceed into taking a DNA sample um, to even learning how to put the animal under anesthesia and actually collect a blood sample. Um, so we do retroorbital bleeds of these animals. Um, it is sticking a capillary tube into the corner of their membrane of their eye behind um, their eye socket into the membrane. And it collects about uh, 100 to 200 microliters of blood, which is useful for us for both pathogen qPCR testing, as well as ELISA testing to look at teeter levels of vaccines. So we need to do that type of sampling to get the largest quantity of blood that's safe for the animal. Um, they learn all the different types of how to do small and large mammal density estimates. So how um, we're deploying camera traps, as well as going through and counting uh, deer pellets to see the uh, estimated number of large mammals. Um, the sampling with the trapping, we use Sherman live traps to trap small mammals, gives us our mark recapture estimate of small mammal densities. So really incorporating all the different avenues um, that we can. Uh, so here's just some pictures of the students working on the various different aspects. We also have students working on any animals that may have um, died in the traps or um, a sampling issue. We have necropsies that are going on and students are working on how to undergo a necropsy, which essentially necropsy is an autopsy of an animal. Um, so looking at what healthy organs look like versus unhealthy or, um, organs. We had a couple students today working on a couple of necropsies and they found some um, parasitic parasites and parasitic egg sacs within the animals. So these are all potential um, things that may have caused extra stress on the animal that related to the death. So we're just kind of incorporating in um, so that we know to moving forward what the potential is for um, losses of these animals. We also have opportunities for students interested in public health. So you might be a science student, you might be a public health student, um, but working with, we have three public health employees, we have a coordinator and two assistants, um, and they go out and do a lot of different educational outreach through um, different schools, different target audiences, uh, developing um, different techniques to be able to educate and engage individuals on how to practice tick prevention, what to look for, and things such as that. So um, some of those things is providing education. Um, so you might attend fairs with them. 
Um, you might work with our customers and understanding what their results mean. So we have individuals that walk into the lab. We have individuals that call. Um, they have a lot of questions of what, what's the testing? What does it mean? What does it mean to be exposed? What's their risk? Um, we also have physicians um, that call in and uh, understanding what their risk of that pathogen is and the exposure and um, helping the physician kind of go to the next step where can they find research on these pathogens? Um, where and how do they um, look for signs and symptoms and helping that physician better understand what the, the patient was exposed to. Um, they have experience working with large data sets, data entry, statistical analyses, different platforms. Um, our public health team is about to uh, submit an IRB application, so Institutional Review Board, um, on a pre-post analysis of our uh, a new sort of package of an educational program. So looking at what the knowledge and behaviors and practices are of Pennsylvania residents now, and then looking at it again after we provide and uh, target different audiences with certain strategies on um, tick prevention and education. Um, so using the statistics to evaluate the success of that program. Um, as well as using statistical platforms and survey platforms like Caltrix is what we'll be using to deploy that. Um, assisting at health fairs, um, this is our research coordinator, our public health research coordinator with a bagel that's loaded with poppy seeds as well as ticks. Um, and the goal is to be able to identify on that poppy seed bagel where the ticks are. Um, and it gets very challenging because they're so small, it's hard to really see and decipher. Um, which gives you an idea of how hard it could be to check your body for ticks um, and to really be patient and to really um, look and um, really understand what you're looking for. Um, our public health students assist with us contacting in, um, different physicians and healthcare facilities. So to spread the word and really saturate the state to make sure that we are getting as much exposure to di different populations as we can and access to different populations. Um, so that we don't just have the same individuals submitting the same ticks year over year. We want as many residents of Pennsylvania and physicians and healthcare uh, facilities to be utilizing our service to get a real good understanding of what's happening in our state um, and how that's changing through time. Um, and they help with interpreting lab testing and results. Our public health students work with the Codimus Keys. They work with identifying ticks and a lot of the basic uh, background um, that they would need to know to help with the, the future and of um, providing education. There's also student experiences in wildlife forensics and population genetics. Um, what is wildlife forensics? Just a little quick thing. I know I did focus on a little bit, but it's a study and application of science, the matter of law. Um, and the goal is to identify physical evidence and then try to reconstruct the scene. So we work closely with state agencies law enforcement, game law enforcement, where we train them, they go to the scene of a crime and an event, they learn how to identify different physical evidence that could be utilized in DNA analysis. They send it to our lab, we analyze it, and we're looking for patterns and um, various different things that we could utilize to give them back an answer. Um, so the students that are interested in it, they start really as a, a basic lab student learning what DNA extractions are, how to handle samples, how to work in sterile environment. But then they start to shadow and gain knowledge in how to handle and sample and process forensics casework, because it is a little different than just other casework. Um, they learn how to evaluate and interpret results. Um, in forensics, you might have one hair sample that you have to work with. Um, so you have to be very careful on how you document that one hand sample because moving forward, that's the only sample you have to work with. Um, so it becomes a little different in how they handle, how they interpret, how they work with the different uh, samples. They understand and work as a student on all the different analyses that you can do. So you might be doing morphological analysis. You might look at hair or samples under a microscope and document what that looks like and what is it consistent with? Is it consistent with something that could be related to a black bear? Is it consistent with something that could be a domestic animal? Is it consistent with something that's a white-tailed deer? Um, so things like that. It could be moving forward to qPCR detection. It could be DNA sequencing. It could be DNA fragment analysis, um, fingerprinting profiles of various different animals to see if different parts from different crime scenes match up and sort of start to rebuild what happened. Was that hunter 
in the field, wasn't sampled from that gut pile, matched the blood that was found in the back of the truck to the meat that was found in his freezer. And looking at all three of those to recreate, putting the hunter at the location where the animal was taken, the animal in his possession in their vehicle that they own, as well as in the possession of the house that they may or own or rent, um, such as that. So really building that case um, and watching um, how we utilize non-human uh, samples to uh, work through forensics cases, just like you would see in uh, CSI. So just a fun, I always like this one, uh, just a fun story to kind of like tie some of this in, um, and then I'll open the floor up for any potential questions. Um, but this was a forensics case years ago. Um, it was a bird strike, so someone was out flying on Christmas Eve, um, and they had hit something. Um, they thought it was a bird. And so any type of strike or any type of thing that happens in air when you're flying an airplane is you have to land and there's an investigation. Um, so the pilot called it in, they did their emergency landing, um, the crew went out, they collected material from the engine, they sent it off to the lab, the lab did DNA sequencing, they looked at different regions of the mitochondrial DNA, and they died, I came back and they identified it to be white-tailed deer. So this plane is out flying on Christmas Eve. The results came back as white-tailed deer. Um, now everyone's getting kind of confused because we don't really know what's happening. Um, anybody want to take a wild guess at what potentially could have happened with this plane hit? Do we think the plane hit Rudolph? It is Christmas Eve. Probably not. Um, so this is a lot of times too in forensics is what makes sense. Because when you're looking at animal DNA, you have DNA of every potential animal that you could be handling. You also have human DNA that's in there as well. So you really have to streamline through, comb through your results to come up with a biologically answer that makes sense. Um, so when they went back to the drawing boards, reanalyzed the sample, they got a result. And it ended up being turkey vultures. And we know what turkey vultures do best is they feed on carcasses. So this turkey vulture happened to probably have fed on a deer carcass prior to the airstrike, um, which resulted in detection of the cervid DNA first over the vulture DNA. Um, so just some fun stuff. Um, so there's various different opportunities for students at the lab. I've talked about some of our opportunities. I mean, it is endless. Um, there are research opportunities. Uh, we had students looking at eDNA. We have students that utilize our data sets that might think of a question that we might not be currently answering. Um, our student that came in this past year that's looking at detecting COVID in ticks um, and how that might be a potential uh, for some re future research. Um, there is some new studies showing that white-tailed deer have been exposed and potential um, detection of the virus within the white-tailed deer population, which has uh, prompted us to start looking at tick populations. Um, and then some students now are thinking about looking at the black bear population to see if maybe black bear, bear black bears are carriers or have been exposed to COVID. Um, so that's endless opportunities. Um, even if you just want to gain experience and, and build on your confidence of being in a lab, if your goal is to go on to be to work in a pharmaceutical company or to work in a lab-based company or to go on to be a wildlife field researcher and to work in ecology fields and learn how to collect data. Um, there's different opportunities for you to hone in on those skills. All of our positions, we try to make them full-time, but we are flexible if you need to work a part-time job. Um, they are paid, which is great. So as a student, you do get paid. Um, our summer opportunities full-time is up to 37 and a half hours a week um, that you can get paid on during the semesters. It's up to 20 hours. So create a great resume, work with the career development crew, apply through our human resources website for student engagements. So if you go to the ESU website under faculty staff, there's human resources and there's a tab for student opportunities. If you click there, you'll see our public health student um, application, our student field and our student lab applications. Um, you'll interview with our team and as we don't really say no to students. So as long as you come prepared and um, you're ready to engage and, and learn, um, you could be part of our team. So with that, does anybody have any questions? Do you have any questions? Do you leave on the show now? <laughs>
anybody online have any questions? You can type them in the chat or ask them. I have a question, Nicole. Yes. Uh, which is which area do you find the highest uh, density of uh, um, ticks? Are they? Is it um, like you have data about state? Is there certain areas that are higher density, or is it uh, approximately uniformly distributed? Yeah. So it is going to vary. Um, all of our data is based. Most of our data is based off of Pennsylvania. So our passive surveillance hasn't honed in on where areas are more dense because it's just based off human population. So you might look at it and say, wow, Pittsburgh is really dense with tick populations, but that's just because there's a larger human population. So if you look at number of ticks versus the human population, it's actually very low. Um, so we are in our active research now collecting ticks from various environments and doing uh, drag sampling and trying to pinpoint areas that are more dense in tick populations. Uh, we are not 100% through that data yet because uh, in order for us to really truly identify that we need to have both, we need to conduct two tick drags at each site during the adult and nymph season and we've only gotten one collection during the adult season. Um, but in theory, if you base it off of our education, areas that have, um, you know, thicker canopy cover on the wo wooded edge, so trail edges, edges of the forest, um, thick leaf litter, areas that would have a large small mammal population, so there might be a lot of down trees, um, a lot of areas for them to nest. Um, definitely more of a deciduous forest-like would be more common. Um, if there's a lot of oak trees, um, which provides more food for mice, gives uh, ticks uh, a food meal and hosts, and then areas that have a lot of large and small mammals to give them opportunities to feed. So it is very complex, but we're trying to be able to pinpoint how to be able to look at an area and say, this is how many deer come through, this is my small mammal population, it's my canopy cover, my deciduous, carnivorous, leaf litter density, et cetera, et cetera what would be the likely density in that area? Uh, I have another question <laughs> for the students. Do they need to be a certain um, year or can a uh, um, freshman rising sophomore curator apply? Do they um, is there any requirement on their uh, academic background? Yeah, great question. I did not mention that. Um, so for the lab-based internships, we do require students to have a minimal of their basic classes from freshman year. Um, so after your freshman year, the summer following, as you go into your sophomore year, um, and if you have a GPA of a 3.0 or higher, um, you'd be eligible to start to work in the lab. Um, it's a great opportunity from that point to start early because that will allow you to become an expert in every area of the lab and really be able to, by your senior year, have a independent project or an independent research project you might be interested in um, to really gain more experience. Um, it could be something related to an honors thesis. It could just be something that you're interested in um, or assisting a current researcher in a project that they're working on. For field-based um, application, you, it does not matter your year. You could be a starting freshman to work in the field crew. Um, some of the data collection there is um, more entry level, so it's not as complex as working with samples and extractions in the, in the clinical side of things. So it's a little easier for freshmen to um, feel comfortable and confident in assisting the researchers in collecting surveys and recording data. Um, they might not advanced to sample collections with anesthetizing a small mammal and do, conducting a retroorbital bleed right away, but they'll at least be able to, you know, go to sites, identify plots, um, flag plots, collect ticks, work on how to identify ticks and some of those basic skills to get them ready.
Any other questions? Um, there's not a question. I have one one last question. <laughs> um, as students uh, progress, do you provide any kind of certification? Do they reach any type of certification or of their skills? Um, um, so we don't yet. Um, we are trying to work on some certifications that we can um, be able to offer. One of which would be the wildlife forensic certification program is to get students if they're able to start their sophomore year to really work into progressing to be able to when they leave ESU apply for their wildlife certification um, through the Society for Wildlife Forensics. Uh, we do offer the ability of students to go to conferences and experiencing the academic world on how to present a poster, how to create posters, how to communicate their research to various different backgrounds and individuals in the scientific community uh, from all different um, you know, agencies or other academics. Um, so there's opportunities for that, but certifications currently, we're working on some opportunity for students to be able to say they're certified in, you know, ASC techniques in a clinical laboratory and things such as that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.